All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Bagby, and this is the Store Trends webinar, Inlift Cash, the Key to All Flash Endurance. Uh, we appreciate everyone taking time with us today. Good afternoon to those of you in the uh, East Coast and the Midwest, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, looks like we had a really good turnout today for the webinar. Uh, we've already got a lot of questions coming in uh, inside of the chat. So if you have a question today and you're watching the webinar, feel free to put it in the Q&A chat. Uh, there's a couple of us here that, are, uh, that can chat back with you and provide answers to your questions. Um, if you would like that question read aloud, if you'll just ask that, just say, please ask this question out loud. We'll answer it out loud. If you just want it answered in the chat, we'll keep it private. Um, if you have any questions that you want to follow up with us offline after we're done with the webinar, uh, please contact Tyler Newberry at tylern at ami.com. Uh, he sent out the information to you for the webinar. So if you'll just respond to his original email, uh, we'll be glad to get your questions to a solutions engineer and we'll provide answers to those questions um, and get you filled in on what, what we know or what you need to know from us. All right, so let's get started. So today we're going to talk about Inlift Cache, the key to all flash storage. We're going to do some really quick introductions. We're going to talk about the life cycle of an SSD. We're going to talk about program and erase cycles. We're going to talk about DWPD, which stands for drive rights per day. We're going to talk a little bit about over provisioning. We'll get into some details around wear leveling, trim commands, and data placement algorithms. And then we're going to talk about how AMI, specifically Store Trends, uses a write tier and a read tier architecture uh, to guarantee the SSD endurance of the SSDs. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about a patented algorithm called Inlift Cache. So, uh, and then we'll finish up the end with a summary. If we have uh, a little open time at the end, we'll answer the questions that uh, are coming in. We still see there's several coming in right now. Um, so again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in that Q&A, and when we get to the summary, we'll read those. All right. So just some really quick introduction, a couple slides here. Introduction to AMI. Uh, most of you probably know us as American Megatrends Incorporated. We were founded in 1985. We're headquartered outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we've got a worldwide presence with 12 international offices with 1,383 total employees. And about 80% of our engineers, uh, or our employees, contribute to an engineering fashion. So we're a very, very deep and heavy engineering-based company. Uh, we've been around since 1985. The product that you probably know us most from is the AMI BIOS. So there's a little bit better than an 80% chance if you restart the computer that you're watching this presentation on now, uh, whether it be a laptop, desktop, whatever it may be, um, you're going to see uh, the bio screen that pops up the, when it reboots and it's got the American Megatrends logo in the corner. So you'll see the, cor the, the logo and the name. Um, that's what most of you probably know us from. Um, we're, again, we're on about 80% of those products, but you probably already know us from some other products as well, and we'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, we have about three, a little over 300 company-wide patents. 114 of those are granted uh, solely on the storage products that we're going to present today from the Store Trends product division. So we'll talk a little bit about some of that technology towards the end of the presentation. All right, another quick product that will probably jog your memory. Um, this was AMI's storage market entry. This is where we first got into the storage market, and it was with the Mega Raid card. So if you're used a Dell server, an HP server, um, you kind of name your server of choice. Um, there's going to be a RAID card in that server that's striping that data across those disks. Um, we created the Mega RAID card back in 1994, and in just one short year in 1995, it became the number one RAID card in the world, picked up by all of those OEMs, shipping it in their servers. Uh, Gartner recognized us as the number one RAID vendor in the world in the MQ for six straight years. We sold that off to the uh, LSI Logic in 2001. So the Mega RAID division was sold off to LSI in 2001, which is now known as Avago Tech or Broadcom. I saw they changed their name officially, I think, yesterday, so we need to update that slide to Broadcom. Um, but this is still the predominant RAID card in the world today. Um, so that's just a testament to the type of technology that we bring to the market um, and the level of technology that we bring to the market. So there's a lot of experience within store trends based off of this RAID. Um, we've got a CTO, our VP of Engineering, and our Directors of Engineering. They were all the brainchild uh, within the Mega RAID group that created the RAID technology, and now they work for us in our Store Trends product division, and they've architected the Store Trends product line. All right, so just a really quick slide here. I want to talk about the data storage evolution. So uh, this would be, if you looked at a roadmap from EMC or NetApp or any other vendor out there, you would see a very similar uh, roadmap. You're going to see spinning disk from 2007 to 4. You're going to see hybrid arrays that came out around in 2012. The hybrid arrays have either four or six SSDs in the front of them. Some have an NVRAM card in the front mixed with HDDs in the back or on a secondary tier. 
And then all flash arrays. In 2015, you started to see all flash arrays kind of hopping around in the market. Uh, this is a tier of all SSDs, all flash within the box. Um, and this is our roadmap, store trends. So in 2007, we were shipping the 3400. In 2012, we were shipping our 3500 hybrid array. And then 3610 came out in 2015. Uh, so just really quickly, I want to kind of level set on the storage evolution of kind of how these products came out, when they were in the market, how they were introduced, um, you know, to the end customers. <clears throat> okay. So let's move to the, the meat of our presentation here. This is talking about SSD endurance. We're talking about SSDs in general. We're talking about a lot of the technologies built into the SSDs and what you need to be cautious of uh, when you're looking at your next generation appliance, whether it be a hybrid array or an all-flash array. So we get this question a lot. You know, hey, aren't all SSDs the same? All, all flash is the same, right? No, not all SSDs are created equally. Um, there's multiple different types of SSDs, multiple different grades of SSDs, such as SLC, MLC, EMLC, TLC, um, and there's mixtures in between those tiers as well, or those grades. Um, so this, uh, this, Im this image here shows you an SLC, an MLC, and a TLC, which are the most popular. Um, SLC stands for single level cell. Um, this is where we write one bit to one cell. So the drive manufacturer provides us with a cell where we can insert one bit into that cell. Um, these are the most costly drives that are out in the market. They're the most expensive. Um, next, you would have MLC. This is multi-level cell. This is where you're going to be able to program two bits per cell, and these are your mid-tier SSDs. And then you have TLC, which are your triple-level cells. Um, TLCs are your three bits per cell. Uh, these are going to be your more cost-effective consumer-grade drives. So TLCs are consumer-grade drives. MLCs are consumer-grade drives. There's a hybrid between SLC and MLC, which is called EMLC, and that stands for Enterprise MLC, which is an Enterprise Class MLC version. Um, and then your SLCs are your true Enterprise high-end grade SSDs. So the market is continuing to evolve. Drive vendors are continuing to come out with more technology. Um, you're hearing things from vendors, from drive vendors today, talking about how they're, they're putting more bits and more sales. You're talking, they're talking 3D NAND flash. Um, there's a lot of different things that are coming out and changes that are coming to the SSDs to make them more dense. So with a TLC, we can pack more bits into a cell, which gives us more capacity, but it also has less endurance. It's going, to, it's going to have a lot more writes going to that because we're packing more bits into those cells. So those drives are going to be prone to more failures, specifically if it's in an intensive you know, write or read environment. That's why TLCs are more targeted towards end customers and targeted towards consumer applications like laptops and tablets and things of that nature. Um, and then as you move to lesser, cell, lesser bits per cell, like an SLC, those are extremely enterprise. Um, they have a lot longer endurance life cycle with them because we're not packing as much data into the cells. We're not programming that as much. So let's kind of step into how some of these cells are programmed and, and talk a little bit about how these vendors uh, want drive or want storage manufacturers to write to these drives and things of that nature. So another question that we get all the time is how long will an SSD last? You know, if I buy a storage array today, if it's an all-flash array or a hybrid array, are these drives going to last a year, two years, three years, five years? You know, I want to run my all-flash array for the next seven years. Will these drives last seven years? That's a great question. And it depends on the build of that drive. So let's talk about some of those components that determine how long that drive is going to last in your infrastructure. So the SSD life cycle, let's just have a real quick overview of the SSD life cycle. SSD are made, SSDs are made up of cells where bits of data are stored within those cells. So we talked about on the previous slide the difference between uh, SLC, MLC, and TLC. Let's talk a little bit about how those cells wear out. So flash suffers from wearing out the cells. So how does that wear occur? It occurs from what's known as PE cycles. These are program and erase cycles. Uh, I had a funny story somebody asked me last week when I said, does anybody know what a PE cycle was? They thought it was physical education. So they had a flashback to high school and thought they were taking a PE class. Um, it's not physical education, it's program and erase. So programming and erasing a cell subjects it to wear due to a voltage that's being applied to that cell when that write is taking place, when we're programming it or when we're erasing it. So every time a voltage is, is being applied to that cell, it's killing that cell slowly. So it's, it's going to slowly die as we continue to apply that voltage. So 
This is a very important factor of knowing how the data is being written to the drives, and it involves data placement algorithms. And we'll talk about that in a couple slides. And I'll kind of explain how storage vendors are using DPA data placement algorithms to write data in a very logical mechanism so that it's, it's written in line, uh, it's written sequentially, it's not random, we're not jumping through and popping different cells within the drives. Um, we're trying to write it uh, sequentially to those drives so that the cells wear out at the same amount of time. So let me just kind of give you a real quick analogy here. Some of you may be lost. You may be thinking, okay, what is he talking about with PE cycles and these programming array cycles wear out a cell? Let's take a piece of paper, let's take a pencil, and the pencil's got an eraser on it. I'm going to ask you to write a one down somewhere on that piece of paper, and then erase it. Write a two, and then erase it. Write a three, and then erase it. And we're going to keep on. And by the time we get to 10, 12, 13, whatever the number might be, that paper is going to eventually have a hole in it. We're going to wear that piece of paper out. The same thing happens with an SSD with program and erase cycles. So we'll program it, which is writing the digit, and erase it with the eraser, and eventually that cell is going to wear out and we can no longer write a number on that piece of paper anymore in that specific spot. We'll have to find another spot to write our next number. That's exactly what happens with an SSD with a PE cycle. So every time there's a PE cycle, that charge is trapped inside of that transistor's gate dialect, and it's going to cause a permanent shift in the, in the cell. So those cell's characteristics are going to change. So after a set number of PE cycles, what we have is a failed cell. So what happens to that cell? Does it just die? Does the data die? Does it become corrupt? Um, this is a question that we get very often as well. No, that cell becomes read-only. It no longer can be programmed or written to within the SSD, so it just turns into a read-only cell. The data that's sitting there can no longer be programmed. It can't be rewritten. Um, that data is, is that, that those bits are there and they cannot be changed. So they become read only at that point in time. Now, you're probably going to read or hear about some of these technologies that help SSDs prolong their life. Trim commands, wear leveling, data placement algorithms. These are things that the drive manufacturers, so the first two, trim commands and wear leveling, are things that the drive manufacturers provide within their drives, um, and they, they allow us to enable those features uh, as a vendor so that we can make sure that the data is written levelly to the drive, it's, it's written evenly to the drive. So this is what we use to slow down uh, wearing out those cells, and we make sure that it's done at an even pace. So by utilizing trim commands, wear leveling, and then writing sequentially with a data placement algorithm, uh, you're going to see those drives all start to, to lose their endurance at the same amount of time. So you'll see them drop to 90%. You'll see them all drop to 80 And there's going to be a 5 to 7% differential in there. So one may be at 77 one may be at, at 81 one may be at 80 79 and so forth as you look across the array for all the drives. But they're pretty much going to all come down in endurance at the same amount of time. And that's because of these, these technologies that are baked into the drives and also the way that the manufacturers are writing their data. All right, so what is SSD endurance? We talked about programming erase cycles. We talked about how there's only so many times you can write to a cell and read from a cell and erase a cell, and then that's eventually going to wear out. So SSD endurance is calculated is a calculated method to estimate the lifespan of the SSD in operation. So once you put your storage array inside of your infrastructure and you start writing data to it, uh, we start watching how those, that data is being written to the drive. We start watching how those cells are being punctured and the, the number of PE cycles that takes place. And then that's going to calculate the SSD endurance. So it's very important to procure the right SSD for your workload and your budget needs. So this is one of those things where you have to kind of understand what's right for me. Is it SLC? Is it MLC? Is it TLC? So endurance effects greatly affects the life expectancy and the cost of those drives. If you remember a couple slides ago, I told you that SLC is very expensive, whereas TLC is more consumer-based and it's a lot less expensive. If you pick TLC drives, they may not last three, four, five years in your infrastructure. If you pick SLC drives, they're probably going to last, but they're going to cost you an arm and a leg. So how do you get the right mixture? Where do you find the right mixture? So. The, the more SSD endurance means it's stronger flash. That means the more it's going to cost. Um, so most people don't recognize when flash is made, it all comes off of the same line, and it's measured. So let's use MLC, for example. 
Um, when MLC flash is made and it comes off of the line, they test that flash. They test the strength of that flash. And it has to meet a certain requirement to be considered enterprise. If it's not enterprise, it goes into the consumer bucket. That's the way they, they judge how the flash is divvied up between enterprise and consumer. And then they stamp what they call a drive right per day on that drive. So again, let's use the MLC for example. Uh, a lot of MLC drives are one drive right per day or less versus an EMLC drive, which is the enterprise EM, uh, MLC drive. It's going to be stamped with 10 drive rights per day or more. Okay, so what is a drive right per day and how does that affect this, this whole thing? So SSD endurance is based on a drive right per day. This is based on the amount of data that you're writing per day to that SSD is going to determine how long that drive will last. So SSD manufacturers, they set a limit on drive rights per day. They set a threshold number. Um, and again, like I said, with an MLC drive, it could be one, it could be 0 0.7, it could be 0 0.3. Um, I've seen uh, MLC drives, you know, below 0.3, which is really should be, that's a very, very low end drive. It's not going to tolerate very many writes at all. So what do you do with a, a drive write per day? What does this mean? How do you calculate based off of this? So it's calculated the drive write per day setting times the capacity of the SSD. So in this example on the screen, we're using 10 drive writes per day. This would be our enterprise MLC drive, and it's a one terabyte SSD. So 10 times one is 10 terabytes of drive writes per day. So I can write 10 terabytes of data to that one terabyte drive every day and it's guaranteed for five years by SanDisk. So SanDisk comes out and says this is an EMLC drive, and again, they tested it, they tested the strength of the flash, so it came out as an EMLC stamp drive, and we're guaranteeing 10 drive rights per day. So that means me as a storage vendor, I can go to you as the end customer and say, okay, you're going to be able to write 10 terabytes of data to this one terabyte drive every day for five years and the drive will not wear out. It will not lose its endurance during that five years. So that's how these SSD manufacturers set the endurance levels. That's how they, they calculate the drive rights per day. So why doesn't everyone just use 10 drive rights per day drives? It's because they're extremely expensive. Um, if you go out and you, you acquire SLC drives or EMLC drives with 10 drive rights per day, if we filled the entire array up, if we gave you 16 or 24 of those SSDs, that array is going to be very, very costly. So what these SSD manufacturers have started doing is they, they understand how us as a storage vendor, how Store Trends as a storage vendor, how we use these drives. They recognize we have certain writes and we have certain reads. So for write drives, we use write intensive SSDs. For reads, we use read intensive SSDs. So we have what we call a write tier and a read tier. So it's a mixed flash architecture. And again, if I gave you the 10 drive write per day SSDs uh, as write tier drives, if I just filled the array up completely with those, this box would be so expensive you couldn't afford it. So by mixing the tiers, it allows me to get a mixed cost in as well. So I'll have a few of the 10 drive writes per day, the higher cost SSD. So let's say there's four in this example. And then I'll backfill the remainder of the array with the one drive rights per day, which are the lower cost SSDs, which are the read enhanced SSDs. So it would be four of the 10 drive rights per day and 12 of the one drive rights per day in that 16 bay array. That would give you the right mixture that you would need for your reads and your writes, but it would also allow for the cost to be reduced so that that, that value shows up in that box and it's something that you can afford to put in your infrastructure. Now, there's, there's only one other vendor that I know out there that uses a mixed read and write tier right now, um, but they still depend on all of the writes going to the write tier and the reads coming from the read tier. They just have a very simplified logic. So on the right side of the screen, if you look at these blocks, this is the way that other vendor does it. This is the way any vendor would do it with a split tier. Your writes would go into the write tier, your reads would come out of the read tier. The question is, what happens to the rewrites or the net new writes that need to move into the read tier? So as data comes in, as IO comes into your box, and let's say that that data is written and it's never accessed, it becomes cold. We don't want it to sit in the read tier. We want that data to eventually move down into, or so we, sorry, we don't want it to sit in the write tier because that's our expensive tier. We want the write tier to only have hot writes inside of it and active writes and rewrites. So if it becomes cold, if block Z is sitting in the right tier, we want to eventually move down into the read tier. 
well, if we just pass block Z down and we start sending rewrites to block Z down and the data starts moving, we're going to blow through that one drive write per day pretty quick. Again, let's use that one terabyte analogy. If we have one drive write per day times a one terabyte drive, it would mean that we can only write one terabyte of data to that drive in a day. If it's beyond the one terabytes, it's going to blow through. So we're going to go beyond the SanDisk warranty and it's going to run out within the first five years. Now again, there's, there's a couple vendors out there. They use pure consumer grade SSDs in their array and their drives are 0.3 drive writes per day. They're gonna wear those drives out. And they tell you, you know, well, we guarantee that it won't run out. And if it does, we'll just replace them. How do you replace those 24 drives in their array? Is it just one drive at a time? Do you have to pull one drive out, put a new drive in, let it rebuild? Once it rebuilds, take the next drive out, put a new drive in, let it rebuild? Are you gonna stand there for two days or three days while you go through all of these drives until they completely rebuild? Or is their strategy to send you another box and they want you to replicate the data off of your primary, your active array to their secondary, replace the SSD drives and then replicate the data back? Are you gonna to have to do a double migration move because they ran out of endurance in those SSD drives? If the drives were able to wear out at different points in time, it would be kind of like replacing HDDs today. So if you've ever managed a storage array out there, you know that HDDs fail. Uh, when they do, it's just usually one drive at a time. So it's pretty easy to replace one drive at a time and kind of move forward. It, it's a hassle, but it's something that's manageable. But in this regard, all of these SSDs are gonna wear out most likely at the same time. So they're all gonna hit a five or a 10% threshold of endurance at the same point in time and they're gonna be subject to run out of endurance. How do you replace them? So make sure you're not getting into, you know, in, in, into the game with a vendor that doesn't understand how they're going to upgrade those SSDs or how they're going to replace those SSDs. As a matter of fact, they shouldn't be upgrading or replacing them at all during your first five years or your first seven years. Um, that, that's something that you shouldn't have to worry about. They should have architected a better solution and a better technology to protect you as the customer so that those drives do not run out. So be very careful of the game that some of those vendors are playing where they say, well, well, we'll give you flash upgrades for free or we'll provide you with a drive if it runs out. It's, it shouldn't run out. Why are you, you know, how do I upgrade those drives? So make sure you ask those questions. So let me tell you what Store Trends has done to guarantee this. This is not just an SSD guarantee. It's, we're guaranteeing that it will not run out of SSD endurance. It's not a guarantee to fix it or replace it. I'm telling you it will not run out of endurance. How can I be so bold and make that statement? It's called Enlift Cache. This is a proprietary algorithm that we've written and what it does is it protects that SSD read tier endurance. So again, I have 10 drive writes per day on my write tier, which is more than enough, but I only have one drive write per day on my read tier, which is questionable. So what we do is we carve out a section on the right tier. It's called Enlift Cache. So if block Z sitting on the read tier needs to be modified, if it's a rewrite that's coming into that block, instead of directly sending that write downstream to the read tier and blowing out my one drive write per day, we consolidate all of those blocks in Enlift Cache. So if more changes come in for that block, we make those changes inside of the right tier, inside of the Enlift Cache zone. So instead of continuing to update the block Z inside of the read tier, we'll do it all in limit of cache, and then we'll do one drive write downstream into the read tier. So we're using the write tier as a caching mechanism for those rewrites coming in and the new net writes coming in to the read tier so we don't blow through this one drive write per day. This is how we protect the read tier endurance, and this is how we can guarantee that you will not have SSD endurance failure in the first five years of this box. Another thing that we do within Store Trends is deduplication and compression, so data reduction. So with an all-flash array, we have the performance to be able to dedupe and compress the data as it's in line coming in the box. So if we're, if we're in your organization and we have Exchange and we've, we're passing around the same email back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, Exchange is only going to compress it. It's not going to dedupe it. So what we'll do on our array, instead of keeping multiple copies of that email, we're only going to keep one master copy in the Delta Changes. So it allows us to dedupe that data. So we're looking for identical blocks and we're discarding the block that we already have. So if there's a duplicate made, that's all done in system memory. It's done in our hot table, what we call our hot hashing table for deduplication. So by deduping that data, it prevents us from having to write all that data into that cache or into that SSD tier. That allows us to save the SSD endurance as well. 
So instead of writing four terabytes into the array, we only write one terabyte because our average IT environment is seeing a four to one data compaction ratio. So this allows us to keep the SSD endurance as well. So if you're looking at some type of an all-flash array, make sure it has deduplication and compression and make sure that it's using those technologies on the front end so that it reduces the data that's written to the SSD as that is an instant saver for the SSD endurance as well. So three technologies here, a mixed read and write tier, in-lift cache, which is the key to our SSD endurance, and then deduplication and compression, which we call data reduction. Those are three things that you need to make sure are in an SSD array that are going to guarantee the endurance of that drive. Okay, so just a few more minutes here and then we'll be done. Um, why is SSD endurance concerning? It's concerning because most of the market's moving to either a hybrid SAN or an all-flash SAN. Um, SSDs are starting to be mixed into the environments. People are starting to experiment with them. A lot of customers have already implemented completely all-flash SANs. Their entire infrastructure is already all-flash. So the movement is occurring to all-flash. So again, if you kind of go back to the, the roadmap, you saw that hybrid was there in 2012 and it's steadily moving forward. We're seeing a lot of customers that are all spinning disk today, jumping hybrid completely and moving straight to all flash. Um, they're not taking the hybrid step. They're going directly to all flash. So if they have a good deduplication ratio or a good compression ratio on their data set, they're moving directly to all flash. Um, so just want to quickly explain here the differences. Hybrid is just a few SSDs with a lot of spinning disk, all flash all SSDs in the array. So your hot data for an all-flash array is stored on all of those SSDs, whereas your hot data with a hybrid is only stored on the SSDs and the cold data is on the HDDs. So I want to just quickly level set here to show you the difference in a hybrid versus an all-flash SAN. The pricing has came into the same price point. So we're starting to see hybrids and all-flashes on the same level. Uh, we're actually seeing all-flashes beat hybrids at some points, specifically if it's around VDI. Um, if it's something that's highly dedupable and highly compressible like a VDI environment, we're seeing all flash sands cheaper than hybrid sands. Um, so the, the game has kind of changed now with, with, hybrid flat, with hybrid storage and all flash. As the price of flash has came down, there's vendors that are competing for that game and that space. Um, you're seeing HDD vendors like Western Digital purchase SSD vendors like SanDisk. Uh, the prices of flash are coming down tremendously, and now we're seeing hybrids and, and all flash sands kind of level set with one another. So which would be correct for you moving forward? Well, it basically depends on your data compaction. Your dedupe and compression ratio determines whether you're a hybrid or an all flash array candidate. So if you're a 3.1 data compaction ratio or better, you're a great candidate for all flash. If you're 3.1 data compaction or worse, um, you're a candidate for hybrid storage. So hybrid's going to have its place. Um, specifically, uh, you know, like around uh, an architectural firm where you're using CAD, it's something that's not going to be deduped well, it's something that we cannot compress well. Um, that is, you're, you would be more of a hybrid SAN architecture candidate. Um, that's where we can give you the amount of flash you need up front and the physical disk behind you. But if you have a three to one data compaction ratio or better, you're more prone to be more uh, move towards the all-flash array. You're going to see a cheaper price out of the all-flash because we can get better deduplication and compression out of your data set. So to know this, we have a tool. It's called the StoreTrends DDP Analyzer. It's on our website at storetrends.com. Um, you can download this for free. It needs to be ran on an unmounted or, or a backup database. Do not run this on a live database. It does generate an I/O load as it's looking for blocks that can be deduped. Um, this tool is very easy to set up. We can provide you with a solutions engineer that can help you set this up in about 10 minutes or less. Um, and this tool is going to come back and tell us what your data reduction looks like. This is going to point us to whether you're a hybrid candidate or an all-flash. So if you're concerned about your DDP ratio, you don't know what it's going to look like on your data set, this is an absolute free tool to run that's going to give you the information that you need to know. And if you're a hybrid candidate and you're wondering how much SSD space do I need versus HDD space, so you're not sure how much flash you need versus hard drive, you would run a tool like StoreTrends iData. This is another tool that's on our website at storetrends.com. It's free to use, free to run, free to download. It sets up in minutes and it runs for seven days in your existing environment. It can plug in at the physical layer or the virtual layer in your infrastructure. And the main thing that it's going to report back to us is it's going to identify the hot data versus the cold data. So we're going to know how much SSD space you need so that you don't underbuy or you don't overpurchase the amount of SSD that you need in the box. So this is how you know how much flash capacity you absolutely need for your infrastructure. Um, so run a tool like this if you're thinking about getting a, a hybrid array. All right, and just closing real quick, this is our summary slide. So 
So endurance is extremely important to the lifespan of SSDs. So make sure the SSDs are protected from, from endurance, from running out of endurance. Further, not just an endurance guarantee where the vendor will replace the SSDs, ask them how they would replace them. Ask them what happens if you need to replace all 24 at the same time. There's programs you're going to hear like Forever Flash, Fresh Flash, Flash Guarantees. They only replace the SSDs when they expire. They don't protect the drives from running out of endurance. So make sure when you get into a solution and you're looking at your next product, it's something that's going to prevent the endurance from expiring. So SSD endurance affects the life expectancy and the manageability of the storage array. All right, and just really quick in closing, uh, we're giving away a DJI Phantom drone to those of you that registered for the event today. Um, the drawing is going to be held on March 24th between 2 and 2.30 Eastern. It's going to be held during our VMware Management and Best Practices with StoreTrends webinar. It's going to be draw, uh, the drawing is going to be live and it will be announced during the webinar. You do not have to be present to win. We will email you if you win the drone. Uh, so thank you for attending today. We appreciate everyone taking time. I apologize, a little long-winded and getting get to the, the questions and answers. Um, we will respond to those in the chat as they keep coming in. Um, we've already responded to a lot of those I see. If you uh, have additional questions, you can send them through the chat. We'll stay on for a few more minutes. Or you can email Tyler Newberry at tylern at ami.com, and uh, we'll be glad to get those answers back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending today. We greatly appreciate your time, and uh, have a great afternoon.